This video is supported by Raycon. What you working on? Oh, nothing. Just, you know, the biggest revolution in transportation technology in the history of mankind. That's it, huh? I've been working on this all night. It required me to take a mechanical engineering class and a physics class and I had to learn some, some CAD software and stuff, but it's totally worth it because I think this is going to change the world as we know it. Want to see it? Oh, I don't. Here. No, oh, please, show me. I call it Omega Tube. It starts with a Hyperloop, but like, like a big Hyperloop, like, like a kilometer-wide Hyperloop. A kilometer-wide tube. Yeah. With a vacuum. Yeah, yeah. And inside that is another tube with a maglev track in it, just like a regular Hyperloop that travels at 500 miles an hour. Okay. But inside that tube is another tube. Ah. A hyperloop inside a hyperloop. Okay, and inside that tube is a rail gun that shoots it at another 1500 miles an hour. Okay, you still with me? Okay, and inside of that tube is another tube. And inside of that tube is a Falcon 9 rocket that can go an extra 2500 miles an hour. And inside of that is a pulse nuclear rocket that can travel at 5000 extra miles an hour. You could get from New York to LA in like 30 seconds. So, what'd you think? Our tree's still up. Oh yeah, I should probably take that down. Uh, but the idea though? Oh, it's garbage. Uh, yeah, I'll burn this in the backyard. The Hyperloop. Few things split a crowd more than this crazy idea of a vacuum tube with a pod traveling faster than a commercial jet. Some people think it's the future, others think it's a literal pipe dream. It's been discussed on and off here and there on this channel for a while now, but there's actually been some, some recent news about it, so I figured it was worth giving it a little bit more airtime. So just in case you don't know what the Hyperloop is, it's basically a high-speed train traveling through a tube at vacuum pressure. There are many different ways of doing this, as we'll get into here in a second, but the basic idea is that you can get a train to go a whole lot faster if you can just remove all that pesky air around it. Like whenever you talk about space flight or orbital speed, the, the speeds at which you're traveling are just out of this world. Yeah, I just did that. But the reason you can go so fast is because there's no air to push against. There's just nothing creating any friction for you to work against, which is why when you start going back into the atmosphere, even in that super high atmosphere that's really thin, it's still, you're going fast enough that it creates a plasma around you. The air just bursts into flames as you hit it. So it's kind of like a way of creating space-like conditions here on Earth, which is why it's easy to see why a rocket guy like Elon Musk might be into it. He drew up a white paper for it back in 2012, and he described it as a combination between a Concorde, a railgun, and an air hockey table. Which might not be the best comparison, because Concords are out of business, railguns still don't really exist, and air hockey is, uh... Well, air, air hockey's pretty awesome, actually. But the thing is, Elon drew up this white paper, and he drew some interest in this project, and then he just kinda made it open source and walked away from it. And if I may editorialize for just a second, Look, Elon Musk is a very, very polarizing figure. So a lot of people discount Hyperloop right out of hand because anytime somebody talks about Hyperloop, they automatically bring up Elon Musk. It's practically called Elon Musk's Hyperloop. Elon Musk's revolutionary transit system, the Hyperloop. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Elon Musk. And the more I hear this, the more it bugs me because Elon Musk isn't really working on this. SpaceX has hosted some competitions on a test track, but for the most part, it's other companies and university groups that are working on it. Elon was too busy at the time with Tesla and SpaceX and The Boring Company and Neuralink and OpenAI and Ad Astra and having Android babies and denying COVID and getting COVID and complaining about pronouns. He's a busy guy is what I'm saying. But it's not even completely his idea. It's just sort of an iteration on a VAC train and the idea behind VAC trains have been around for a very long time. Yeah, you'd have to turn the history books all the way back to 1799. Yeah, 1799. That's how long the idea of a back train has been around. In 1799, a fellow by the name of George Medhurst looked at the steam locomotive, which was brand new at the time, still being developed really, and decided he could do better. He came up with what he called the atmospheric railway, a tube that would have a vacuum placed in front of it and thereby create a differential of pressure sucking the train forward. And while this idea never really took off, there were some working versions that were created out there. In fact, there's one that's still in existence at an airport in Brazil. Medhurst later developed the idea further by publishing a paper titled A New Method of Conveying Letters and Goods with Great Certainty and Rapidity by Air. Yeah, he basically invented the pneumatic tube system that you see at banks and, and pharmacies and stuff like that, which is... It's kind of cool. 
Around the turn of the century, Michael Verne, the son of Jules Verne, imagined a ride on the Boston to Liverpool Pneumatic Tubes Company in a short story titled An Express of the Future. In fact, one of the first subways in New York was the Beach Pneumatic Tube Line in 1870, but it was only one car and it only lasted a few years. Also, Robert Goddard, one of the early rocket pioneers, wrote a short story for creative writing class in college about a high-speed maglev back train in a story he called The High Speed Bet. Boris Weinberg built the first prototype back train at Tomsk Polytechnic University in 1914. And the idea would float around here and there for most of the 20th century. In the 1970s, the RAND group started pushing for a back train system, but ultimately it didn't get off the ground. So in a lot of ways, the back train is like the monorail, this great idea that's just never really delivered on the idea. Monorail. What's it called? Monorail. So by the time Elon wrote the Hyperloop paper in 2012, the idea had been around the block a few times. Like your mom. The main innovations he brought to the idea was instead of using a maglev system in a vacuum, he's used a near vacuum in what are called air bearings or air skis. Basically, once the pod got going fast enough, it funneled the air underneath the pod and then just rode on a cushion of air. This is the air hockey table part of the description. And that part of the equation has been mostly dropped by the people who are developing this. At this point, most of them are just going with a traditional maglev system. I kind of feel like I should explain what a maglev system is, just in case. It stands for magnetic levitation, and it, and it basically works off the same principle as when you were a kid and you would push one magnet around by repelling it off of another magnet, you know? Except in this case, it uses giant electromagnets in the track and on the train to allow the train to just float above the track, reducing friction down to almost nothing. And the trains push forward by alternating repelling and attracting electric fields, so there's not really any moving parts. By the way, you take that idea and roll it up, and you basically have a description of the motor that powers electric cars. There's various versions of maglev, like the linear induction motor and the linear synchronous motor, but the point is they're electric, so they're emission-free, and they let the train go extremely fast. How fast? Up to 375 miles an hour on a superconducting maglev, which I should say 600 kilometers per hour, because there's none in the United States. Although they are popular in China, Japan, and Korea. Which, boo, by the way, because that could get from Dallas to Houston in 45 minutes. Boo. But if it goes this fast while still pushing through our atmosphere, just imagine how fast that could go in a vacuum. And that's, that's basically what Hyperloop is. It's a maglev train in a vacuum tube. But if you want to talk celebrity billionaire entrepreneurs that are into Hyperloop, you shouldn't be looking at Elon Musk. You need to be looking at Richard Branson. Branson's company Virgin bought out the early startup Hyperloop One and began pursuing the concept under their new name, Virgin Hyperloop, because unlike Elon Musk, Virgin has nothing else going on. And Virgin actually has some builds going on right now, including one in India to connect Mumbai to Pune, I believe that's how it's pronounced. It's, it's a 100-mile Hyperloop, and it's being funded by Saudi money. Feel free to read into that however you will. And as of right now, they've got projects being considered all around the world, including in the USA, Canada, Mexico, United Kingdom, and others in India. There's also cargo versions of Hyperloop being considered, which I can imagine Lex Bezos being interested in. But all that being said, Virgin's making some great headways, and they're already doing some tests, which, as Elon always says, you know, everything works in a lab, that doesn't mean it's going to work out in the real world, but we'll see if they come up with more concepts, and we'll see what works out in the future. And if they do manage to pull it off, they will finally make possible an idea that's been floating around since 1799, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. But they aren't the only people working on this. Hyperloop Transportation Technologies is based out of Toulouse, France, with a commercial prototype in the UAE and a cargo prototype in the port of Hamburg, Germany. They're looking to not only get people to places faster, but our things as well. These guys incorporate some of Elon's ideas, like integrating solar panels into the tubes, and they use what they call a passive maglev system. It uses a magnet arrangement called the Halbach Array to make them stronger. That, combined with some other proprietary tech, they've called Inductrack. One of their bigger projects in the works is the Chicago, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh route, and they've done some tests and determined that a Hyperloop would have a net economic positive, but this was their own analysis, so grain of salt. Transpod is one of the more sci-fi looking projects, but they're also way behind the last two. It uses a couple of propulsion methods, including an axial compressor at the front that diverts air out the back, and uses an ultra-high-speed contactless power transmission that they call quantum power. They also have a self-canting mechanism they call jet glide that allows it to easily rotate and tie to curves. Like most of the Hyperloop tech, it's a low-pressure tunnel that allows for super-fast speeds up to 1,000 kilometers an hour. They seem to have a good team together, but they also seem to be lagging as they're not doing a full test by 2022-2023. Heart Hyperloop has some big plans. They want to create a 10,000-kilometer European Hyperloop network, and they've already built a fully functional test track with fully functional core Hyperloop systems installed, such as the levitation, propulsion, lane switch, and the vacuum environment. 
Now there's a few things about their approach that are unique. For one thing, their pods are actually suspended from the tracks above the pod. The other is theirs incorporates lane switching technology, which I have no idea how that works. But this would allow them to branch routes from one line to another, more like a subway system. In fact, they seem to be thinking more about how to integrate their system with traditional infrastructure. They also use a permanent magnet propulsion system, which is more expensive, but far more efficient. So yeah, big plans, but at the moment they've only accomplished a low speed test, and I mean low like grandma on a Sunday slow. But they're working to build a coalition of private and public companies working together to get Hyperloop done in the best way possible called the Hyperloop Development Program. But as of right now, they've got a long way to go. Zillaros is similar in design to Transpod in that it uses an air compressor partly for propulsion. Their thing seems to be reducing the cost of the track itself by spacing the electromagnets out more and relying the air to do more of the work. This also means that their tubes don't have to be as depressurized as much as other tubes, which cuts down on cost, but it's also safer, more like flying in an airplane. But either way, they're a little bit behind the others. They don't even have a test track built yet that I'm aware of. Now, one concern is that each one of these companies would have to have their own infrastructure because they all use different systems of propulsion. You know, it's not like a road or even a train track where literally anything can, can ride on it and everything's fine. You know, you can't switch from a passive maglev to an active maglev to a linear induction maglev and everything be okay. So Hart, Zelleros, Transpod, and another early player, Hyperpoland, have formed a joint technical committee called JTC20 to create some Hyperloop standards across Europe. In case you haven't noticed, there's a lot going on in Europe with Hyperloop. Yes, lots going on, but also lots of reasons to be skeptical. When it comes to Hyperloop criticism, it's kind of hard to distinguish between how much of it is legit criticism of the technology and how much of it is just Elon Musk hate, which again is ironic because he's not really that involved with this. And a lot of the Nelson ha-has that I've seen directed toward Hyperloop have to do with the rudimentariness of the technology and the demonstrations that have been so far. Uh, although I don't feel like that's really fair because they are just demonstrations and prototypes and they're just testing out specific parts of the technology. I mean, comparing these tests with what Hyperloop could be to me is like comparing the Apple Newton to the iPhone 12, you know? Everything has to start somewhere. But yes, there are major issues to contend with if Hyperloop is ever gonna become a legitimate form of transportation. First and foremost is the vacuum tube. Have you ever seen a tank implode? Yeah, have you ever wanted to be shrink-wrapped by steel? Yes, nature abhors a vacuum. And if you're inside of that vacuum, nature abhors you. It's difficult to keep a freight tanker at vacuum pressure. Imagine hundreds of miles of tube. And then there's the temperature differentials between day and night that cause expansion and contraction, plus the shock waves of the train going through over and over again. Metal fatigue is definitely a thing. A lot of the criticisms I've heard about the Hyperloop involve the threat of terrorism, that somebody could take it down really easily. I mean, just shooting a bullet at it would completely take out a whole section of it. So that's, that's valid, but I think even beyond that, it's just the structural challenges of wear and tear and maintenance over time, not only would that become really expensive, but um, you would just have to constantly stay on top of that to prevent some kind of disaster. Plus, keeping a vacuum pressure in such a large tube over a long period of time would take a lot of energy. I think that might actually remove any of the green arguments for Hyperloop. Now, there is an option that could help with that, and um, this will probably make the whole thing a little bit more confusing, but tunnels. Because along with Elon being brought up whenever Hyperloop is mentioned, I also see the Boring Company being brought up whenever Hyperloop is mentioned as if the Boring Company was there to create tunnels for Hyperloop, which is not really the point. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never really seen Elon say that one is made for the other. Yeah, the Boring Company was always involved with just shuttling cars around in regular tubes. There's nothing vacuum pressured about them that I've ever seen, so... They don't really have anything to do with each other. But that being said, tunnels being bored through solid rock might have more structural stability than a metal or fiberglass tube. So there is an opportunity there. And then there's the issue of speed for human travelers. You know, we're talking about going 500 miles an hour and trains do derail or detube, I guess, in this case. I mean, look, astronauts on the space shuttle are traveling 17,000 miles an hour, but they're like hundreds of miles away from anything else. Now, of course, every time human transportation is leveled up in speed, there's been arguments that it's not safe because it's so much faster and all those different transportation methods have been made safe. So maybe this is another example of that. And there are other problems like land rights. I mean, if you think it's easy to take over farmland, then you've never met a rancher who hates the system. So that's gonna be a long and costly process, which is one of the reasons why a high-speed train is not taken off more in the United States. Now, many say that Hyperloops could just travel right alongside our existing, you know, highway infrastructure, but the turns on the Hyperloop, because they're going so fast, are gonna have to be so wide, that's gonna be practically impossible. And last, but probably most important, is the argument that when it all comes down to it, the economics just might not be there. 
Ultimately, you have to sell enough seats to make the whole venture profitable. And when it all comes down to it, these pods just don't carry as many people as, say, a plane or a train. Now, what we might see is cargo hyperloops for manufacturing and shipping hubs. If it's that much faster than airplanes, then that might actually be a feasible option. You know, we could work out all the kinks in the cargo systems before we ever put people on there, and it would definitely increase confidence in potential human passengers in Hyperloop if we'd been doing it with cargo for a while and it all had been proven safe. And that might be kind of cool when you think about it. You know, those, those pneumatic tubes that I mentioned earlier about, you know, the banks and the pharmacies and stuff, like, that was kind of a thing back in the day. Buildings were built with these massive pneumatic tube systems so that somebody at the top floor could deliver a message down to the people at the bottom floor or the middle floors or whatever. I mean, it was like, it was like the internet of its day. Who knows, maybe that's how we'll move things around in the future. We'll, we'll bore tunnels throughout the, the country and just fling stuff around from one place to another underneath the, the surface, you know? Fewer trucks on the road, fewer planes in the sky. It's not the worst idea. But I think for a lot of people when it comes down to it, Hyperloop is just the next, next big thing, you know, it's, and it's become this, this big cash grab. You know, we've seen so many disruptions to fundamental infrastructure over the last few decades that everybody wants to be a part of the next one. And that leads to crass opportunism at the best, straight up scams at the worst. So look, I get the criticism. And as I just mentioned, there are many valid ones. But hey, if some Saudi prince wants to throw billions of dollars at a burgeoning technology, I'm not gonna stop him. Although, these are dark times and there's probably a lot of people that could use that money, so I get that argument too. So maybe in a decade or so, we could be whisked around the country in the luxury of a Hyperloop, or we could be talking about that crazy thing that people flush billions of dollars down the toilet trying to make happen. I mean, Hyperloop would be cool, but to be honest, I mean, for me, just, just give me a high-speed maglev system. That'd make me happy. I mean, come on. Because right now it takes forever to get anywhere in this state, which I have to fill the time by listening to podcasts on my Raycon earbuds. Hey, 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 hey. So I've talked about Raycon in the past and how uh, I was in the market for new earbuds and that's just happened to be when they reached out to me and it turns out I, I kind of fell in love with them. They're actually pretty great. And uh, I've had them now for like eight months. Honestly, I've never had any major problems with them. And in fact, I just recently got an Apple Watch and uh, it's been kind of great. I can go for a run without having to take my phone because this syncs and plays right off my watch. It's like magic, it's awesome. These are the E25 Everyday Earbuds. They fit great, they sound awesome. They come in a variety of colors and have a bunch of different silicon ear fitting thingies. So they'll work with you even if you have weird ears like mine. They come in this sweet little magnetic carrying case. They just snap right in there and they charge off the battery in the case, which gives you six hours of battery life, six hours. Seriously, I've only had these run out like once in, in the eight months that I've had them. You know, we're all stuck in our homes with each other these days, but you can just pop these babies in and you can watch your your, your content on your phone or on your TV or whatever and, and not bother the other person. These will save your marriage. I also like that you don't need a PhD to use them. They're super intuitive. They've got buttons on each one of these. So if you want to go to the next song, just click twice this way. Go back, click twice this way. If you want to up the volume three times this way, three times that way, super easy. And they're also like inconspicuous. Like you wouldn't even know I had them on. They're about half the price of comparable earbuds, and if you go to buyraycon.com slash Joe Scott, or just click the link in the description, you can get 15% off of that. Now, I, I seriously was considering paying quite a bit more for some custom-fitted earbuds, because I just have so much trouble finding earbuds that actually fit my ears, but then these came along, they fit great, and I've had no problems with them, so yeah. So yeah, if you're in the market for some earbuds and you don't feel like mortgaging your home to pay for them, I can definitely recommend these. I've had a really great experience with them. So yeah, get 15% off when you click on the link down in the description below. Tell them I sent you. I think you'll enjoy it. All right, thanks to Raycon for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon who are forming an awesome community and supporting the channel and helping me build a team and everything. I want to shout out some names real quick. We've got Sammy Yakubi, LG Beckwith, Shelby Ray, Dr. What? <laughs> Uh, Nathan Mariorna, Sean Gibson, Jonathan Lewis, Darren Fulton, Trevin Bietti, uh, Dave Portnoy, Molly Scrivens, John, Katie Reed, Bradley Battles, J Tony J. Dietz, and Harrison Mills. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, exclusive live streams, and all kinds of other goodies, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, Google thinks you might like that one, and because they're watching you all the time, 
they're probably right. Uh, so you can go check that out or any of the others that might be recommended here on YouTube. And, uh, and if you enjoy them and you're not subscribed, uh, I encourage you to subscribe because I come back with videos every Monday. But I guess I'll put it to you guys, not that I need to say this, but uh, do you think Hyperloop is gonna happen? Do you think it's a scam? Uh, start sharing your Thunderfoot videos down in there. I know you're going to, uh, but I would like to hear what you think about it. So discuss in the comments below. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening week, stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.